Good morning and welcome to our webinar, uh, G2P OnRamp to Financial Inclusion, hosted by the Center for Financial Inclusion at Axion. Um, we're going to get started um, pretty soon here, but I'm just going to go over a few housekeeping details once more. First, we have muted all of the participants for the duration of the presentation, but we're happy to call on people individually if they raise their hands or type in a question in the chat box. Um, and Guy Stewart, our presenter today, may leave a bit of space for questions um, at particular points in his presentation. Um, or it's possible that uh, if there are, um, if the flow is, is in a particular way, we'll, um, we'll ask for those questions towards the end of the hour. Um, second, you can use that chat function that's in the webinar software to ask questions. Um, feel free to reach out to us for help if you're having issues with the technology. And finally, I wanted to let you know that we're recording that session and we will be sharing it on our website for those who wanted to participate but were unable to do so. So feel free to keep that in mind as you, um, as you voice your questions. We're also actually happy to ask your questions anonymously if that's, um, if that's something you would prefer. So hello and welcome. My name is Sonia Kelly. I'm the Director of Research at the Center for Financial Inclusion, and I also lead the CFI Fellows Program. Um, the Center for Financial in Inclusion is an action-based think tank based in Washington, D.C. Um, we are of the firm belief um, that the world can be and will be more financially inclusive. And by that we mean um, people will have access to a full range of quality financial services um, in a competitive market environment um, with value for clients and uh, a, an emphasis on financial capability. Um, the CFI Fellows Program was started last year in an effort to make, to build momentum um, towards some of the big unanswered questions in financial inclusion. So Guy Stewart was one of four fellows um, in this past year who was working on these big questions that frankly we honestly did not know the answer to um, and we didn't see um, compelling answers um, out there in the world. And I think Guy Stewart's research is um, is unique in, in the sense that it answers a question um, that has been asked quite frequently and we were hoping there would be a different answer to the question at this point, but we'll, we'll share a little bit more about that as we go through the hour. Um, I should also mention that this webinar is an extension of Financial Inclusion Week, which was last week. It was a week-long event with conversations, webinars, and momentum towards financial inclusion. We had over 40 events around the globe, um, and this is one of them. It comes at the very end. So thanks, all you all, for joining us for that as well. So let me um, first go over a couple framing questions that I think are important to our conversation. Um, we're going to advance to the next slide. These framing questions are, one, how can G2P programs be better designed to help beneficiaries increase their active use of financial services? And two, how can G2P programs be better designed to help beneficiaries increase their financial capability? I think you'll hear in Guy's research um, that there are significant barriers to G2P programs leading to financial inclusion, um, but I hope that that's not what we end on today. I hope that we can talk about um, some active steps that the financial inclusion community is taking toward the goal of G2P programs leading to financial inclusion. Let me introduce Guy Stewart. As I said, Guy was a CFI fellow for the past year. And he's a busy person. He is also a fellow at the Ash Center at Harvard. And in his spare time, or rather as a full-time job, he is also the executive director of microfinance opportunities. Guy was able to leverage um, the support of microfinance opportunities for this research. And I think you'll see um, just how robust it was able to be as a result. Um, he's somebody who's a problem solver, and, and that's what I've found by working with him. Guy sees problems out into the in the world and tries to figure out ways to better define them and to better solve them. And so he's, I think, exactly the right person um, to undertake this research, and that's what we were um, excited about when we chose him as a fellow. 
the question he was asking in his fellowship was, do government-to-person payments, and particularly electronically enabled government-to-person payments, lead to financial inclusion? This is a question that um, has been asked, I'd say, over the last decade even um, by various organizations. But given the momentum we've been seeing around this question and the excitement we've been seeing um, about the possibility of G2P leading to financial inclusion, we were really hoping that the answer would be yes, absolutely. G2P is an on-ramp to active use of financial services. Um, but instead, Guy found that G2P was not a silver bullet to financial inclusion. And that's all I'm going to say. I don't want to give anything else away. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Guy Stewart. Thank you, Sonia. And uh, thank you to the Center for Financial Inclusion and Axion for hosting this webinar. Um, it's a real pleasure to work with uh, Sonia and her team. Um, I want to start by also acknowledging other um, uh, people who have supported this work. Um, uh, staff at Microfinance Opportunities, uh, the Pakistan Microfinance Network, which did the field research uh, for this work in Pakistan, uh, the Centro de Formación Empresarial, um, Fundación Mario Santo Domingo in Colombia, who, did, who um, worked uh, to support uh, one of the MFO staff members, Gustavo Sanabria, in the field work there. Um, I also had the, the honor and pleasure of uh, presenting to uh, staff at the Benazir Income Support Program in Pakistan with uh, preliminary results from my work. Um, and I should also note, not on this slide, is the, um, the World Bank uh, um, staff in Pakistan who are working with the Benazir Income Support Program, uh, um, and they were extremely um, generous with their time and sharing with me some of their thinking around uh, G2P payments and um, uh, financial inclusion. Next slide, please. Um, did we get a next slide? Yeah, did you want the overview slide or the introduction? Um, just. Just, let's just, uh, my apologies, yeah, I've got the overview slide. Perfect. Great, that's good. Um, so, uh, the, as Sonia mentioned, the original research question, um, I'll, I'll, this is just an overview of the presentation, I'm jumping ahead. Um, what I'm going to do is, is provide you with a little bit more information on the original uh, purpose and scope of the research. The conceptual framework that I developed um, that framed the research, but then also grew out of the research. So I started with a, with a conceptual framework, and then I um, added to it um, after I'd done the research. Um, and I'll also uh, cover the, the um, uh, research methods that I used. Uh, once I've done that, um, I'm going to talk about uh, G2P in a global context. And then we'll hone in on uh, specific field results from Colombia and Pakistan, and then end with some concluding thoughts. Next slide, please. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. So the original research question was, uh, do G2P payments serve as an on-ramp to financial inclusion, and if so, how? Um, and the, the focus was not only on um, G2P generally, but more specifically, uh, how digital G2P payments uh, lead to uh, financial uh, inclusion. So uh, people receiving their uh, welfare payments, their income support payments, through a bank account or through a mobile money account. And I should note that um, in all of this, we've, I've focused on um, income support payments, uh, not pension payments and other payments to, uh, and the salary payments to teachers or pension payments to civil servants. This is about income support uh, payments. Okay, I've lost the presentation. Okay. Um, and as part of, as a result of this original research focus, 
um, what ended up happening is that I was able to generate some information on how to how G2P payment systems themselves are working. Next slide, please. So the, the, the conceptual framework that I developed initially and then, and then elaborated uh, looked at various uh, mechanisms, uh, really it should be mechanisms in that uh, first column heading, uh, mechanisms by which um, um, G2P might result in financial inclusion. And one is uh, a mechanism that has to do with the transaction experience. And um, there's, a, there's a lot of work that's been done on the trust and confidence that low-income people uh, do or do not have in um, using um, digital interfaces uh, using and especially using those digital interfaces uh, at um, uh, sort of uh, agent shops or, or um, even ATM machines. Uh, there's, there's a lot of information, a lot of data, a lot of research uh, showing that, that, that uh, trust in the transaction itself and confidence in executing the transaction cannot be taken for granted amongst low-income populations but have to be built up over time. I was at the um, uh, Symposium on Financial Inclusion last week in Kigali and uh, the, the, the final speaker on the first day was uh, Nick Hughes who uh, helped to found uh, M-Pesa and now is um, uh, uh, one of the principles behind MCOPA, which is a uh, selling solar home systems, and his emphasis on building the trust of, of his clients um, was was at the forefront of his talk. So, um, so that the so the idea would is that if someone is receiving a G2P payment through some sort of mobile or money or bank account, they gain experience in interacting. Uh, with their account. They gain experience in navigating the mobile money interface or the ATM interface and therefore um, become used to um, using these sorts of systems and so therefore are more likely to take up and use um, other offerings that are made to them through um, digital systems. So that's one, one way in which uh, G2P can result in financial inclusion. A second is um, uh, related to that is that uh, one of the things that we found in our research was there was some really interesting group dynamics, especially amongst women, where there was a mutual support um, going on. And so that uh, even if women lacked knowledge about how to navigate the digital system, they got, got support from other women and learned learned about navigating the system or, or if they weren't able to really have a lot of confidence in navigating the system, receive support from other women on an ongoing basis. And this is, so this is something that came out of the research. That's the group dynamics element. A second mechanism by which um, uh, G2P can lead to financial inclusion, and I should note when I talk about financial inclusion, I mean not only uh, access but also use of a uh, formal uh, financial service. Um, that's the sort of working definition I'm working on uh, when I talk about financial inclusion here. Um, so the second mechanism is the functionality of the financial tool. So uh, if you're getting a G2P payment through a savings account, that account has other functionalities that you might, um, the, the people who um, are receiving their payment might be able to use. Uh, they might be able to keep money in their account. They may be able to deposit money in an account. They also may be able to use the account to transfer money to someone else digitally or receive a transfer some, from someone else. So they're getting a G2P payment, but they also may get a payment from a, a husband who, who lives abroad or a, a, an uncle who lives uh, in a major city who's uh, willing and able to send them money digitally. A third mechanism by which um, G2P can lead to financial inclusion is simply because they're developing a relationship with the financial service provider 
and that financial service provider may be uh, willing and able to um, cross-sell other products to, uh, to the um, recipient of the G2P payment. And then finally, the, the next two are about uh, sort of broader, to, broader impact of G2P on uh, the recipients. So G2P provides income support to low-income people, it improves their economic well-being, and we know that um, uh, generally financial inclusion is correlated with income. Um, and so uh, it may be the case that uh, simply receiving a G2P payment, one is in a better position to use um, financial services. And then related to that, but a little bit different, is this idea that G2P payments come in what Stuart Rutherford calls useful lump sums, which are, are larger than normal uh, lump sums of money, lump sums of money that people wouldn't normally have. Um, so if you're getting a payment every uh, quarter, uh, through the Benazir Income Support Program, and it's, it's 4,500 rupees, so about $45. That's a, a big chunk of change that you wouldn't normally get. And so it offers the opportunity for people uh, to improve their economic well-being in a, in a fairly direct manner in that they, they can use this lump sum to, say, invest in an asset that they wouldn't otherwise be able to buy. Okay, so that's the, those are the mechanisms. So let me tell you a bit about the research. So next slide, please. So the, the, the methods we used to gather data, one, we, we did a global review of G2P programs. We also analyzed the 2014 FINDEX data from 95 developing countries. And then we did field research in Pakistan and Colombia in Pakistan, we were able to do observations of transactions at eight different sites over three days in Punjab, Sindh, and, and KP. Um, and then we also did uh, focus groups in, in Pakistan. In Colombia, we did uh, 10 focus groups in three different regions of the country, Mogata, Barranqui, and Cartagena. Um, so so that's the, those are the data that we gathered. Uh, next slide, please. I'm not seeing the next slide. Um, is the slide you're looking for existing reports on G2P? Um, if, you, if you could just cycle through. I, I'm seeing nothing. Right. Great. Yes, that's great. So um, from the global perspective, what we did was we looked at reports reports on G2P um, from 19 developing countries. We used uh, a lot of, CGAP has done a lot of work on this, and a lot of these reports were from CGAP, but there were also other reports from other organizations. And um, we basically coded the reports to see whether uh, there was any mention of problems with the basic delivery of money. And in all but three countries um, there were, uh, that we covered, there were reports of problems with the G2P payments themselves. Um, in discussions of Brazil, Fiji, and Niger um, that we saw, there, there, there were no indications that there were problems. And then we also looked to, to code the reports as to whether they mentioned any sort of benefit to financial inclusion. And only in the case of Fiji were we able to find that uh, someone had reported that there was an increase in financial inclusion as a result of the G2P program. Um, Fijians were leaving money in their, their accounts and then making multiple withdrawals over time, which suggests um, they were using the accounts for money management. Next slide, please. Um, we also analyzed FINDEX data um, collected by the Gallup and the World Bank, and we did uh, some basic econometric uh, analysis and uh, controlling for income, education, age, and um, country. And uh, we found that G2P generally, whether it's digital or not, um, didn't uh, increase savings, but not necessarily in formal institutions. A, a lot of the increase in savings, what we saw was the increase in savings at home uh, was the, the, the impact of G2P. Um, we also found that G2P did enable increased borrowing, um, and we did find that increased borrowing from formal financial institutions. 
contributions, which would suggest a, a financial inclusion impact. I'm not sure what the story is behind that, but, but that was something that came out in the data. Um, we also saw an ability to borrow store credit, get store credit, which is something I'll talk about later, and an ability to borrow from family and friends. Uh, and with the basic idea being that if you're getting a, a, a lump sum payment of you know, $45 or something like that, that people may be more likely to lend you money because they know that you're going to get uh, an amount that they that can repay them. We also um, were able to manipulate the Findex data in a way to identify the impact of, of digital GDP on top of um, uh, regular GDP, cash GDP. And we did find that there was uh, an increase in saving in a formal, informal financial institution as a result of getting your money um, digitally. Um, and, but the numbers are still low. Uh, so it was uh, less than one in five digital GDP recipients reported saving in a formal financial institution in the previous 12 months. So the, the data do suggest some uh, bump up in financial inclusion, um, and, but not to a great extent. Uh, next slide. So now I'm going to uh, sort of dig deeper into the question of financial inclusion, uh, GDP and financial inclusion, by looking, uh, reporting out some of the results from um, the field work we did in Pakistan and, and, and Colombia, and starting with the transaction experience. And as I said before, um, we did um, gather data where we actually observed the transaction experience in various sites across Pakistan. And uh, we, we had people essentially uh, sitting in agents' offices and what, monitoring what was going on. And what we found was, excuse me, uh, what we found was that um, even though uh, the Benazir Income Support Program is a program targeted at low-income women, and the women are the ostensible beneficiaries of the program, they, they are the ones who, um, own the account, they are the ones in whose name the, 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 uh, the card is issued, the card that they use to withdraw money is issued, um, and they're the ones who receive the PIN number that goes along with the card. Um, but what we found was that only about half of the transactions were conducted by women. Um, and uh, often what we found was that um, when uh, either men went on behalf of women to conduct the transaction and took their card and their PIN number with them and, and, uh, and conducted the transaction uh, without the woman present. Um, there was also situations where uh, men would bring uh, the women along with them, but the men would conduct the transaction. Um, and then in 30, over 35% of the cases, around 35% of the cases, the women went alone and conducted the transaction themselves. Um, but in, in amongst all the, this mix of different types of uh, transaction, um, we only saw that women conducted the transaction half of the time in Pakistan. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, but regardless of who conducted the transaction, what we saw was uh, a, a consistent um, basic um, uh, transaction experience for everyone, men and women. And this was almost uh, you know, over 90% of the time, which is that when uh, the person with the car went into the agent's shop, they handed the card and the PIN number written down on a piece of paper over to the agent, and the agent swiped the card in the point of sale machine and then uh, entered the PIN number for the person and then handed over the money that, the, um, that was um, authorized by the transaction. And so um, in terms, you know, going back to Sonia's original question about financial capability, um, as a basic uh, um, on-ramp to getting people to 
engage in the experience of withdrawing money from a digital account, what the recipients that we observed in Pakistan had learned to do was to hand over their card and hand over their PIN number to an agent for the agent to do it for them, um, which uh, in financial inclusion circles um, is considered to be uh, a, an insecure transaction with all sorts of um, abilities for people to be uh, defrauded of money. Um, we also observed different rates at which uh, people um, received receipts after the, um, after the transaction. In Karachi, we, we did find that uh, agents were handing back receipts, but in other areas they did not. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, in terms of uh, general um, experience, in, uh, and this is based on the focus group data, um, the women in Colombia that we spoke to really liked the whole experience. Um, they liked um, being able to go to the ATM, withdraw the money, um, and they did, did all of this themselves and uh, without any trouble. And so uh, that was, that was a, a clear finding from Colombia is the, the, the recipients of the Acción, and Acción Familiar um, um, program were, sorry, Familias and Acción program, um, they, were, they were very happy with, with how they're getting their money out digitally. Uh, in Pakistan, as I've already said, um, there was a variety of different experiences um, and uh, where women were sometimes doing this for themselves and other times uh, were doing this in groups. Women were going to the AT, in, in this case, um, the, the women we talked to in Pakistan were often going to ATM machines. They were going to ATM machines in groups and helping each other out. Um, but they were also um, going to uh, the ATM machine with their husband, and the husband was doing the transaction. Um, so different experiences in Colombia and Pakistan. And then next slide, please. We also found that in Pakistan, as opposed to Colombia, there were a bit more concern about um, people's confidence in conducting the transactions. And uh, these are uh, from rural focus groups that we conducted. And these were actually conducted with men because we, we found it difficult to convene women focus groups in rural areas in Pakistan. And, uh, but these were men who had direct experience with the Benazir Income Support Program, uh, they, their wives were um, recipients. And they all um, expressed, in many cases, they expressed uh, concern about the, um, the whole uh, process, um, especially concern about doing anything with an ATM card. And as a result, many of them um, ended up withdrawing money from, um, through an agent. Next slide, please. Um, as I noted earlier, there were examples in both sets of data in, um, ab uh, about of um, women providing mutual support. In the Columbia case, it was around mutual support um, to women to enable them to comply with the conditions for receiving their cash transfer from the government. So Colombia is a conditional cash transfer program, um, and uh, women reported having a mother leader or a municipal liaison who helped make sure that the women were in compliance with the conditions of the cash transfer, namely making sure they they had paperwork to support the fact that they were sending their kids to school and had the paperwork to support the fact that um, they were taking their kids to a health clinic. And, and so um, that was a, one of the ways in which um, the women in Colombia coped with this complex um, conditions 
In Pakistan, uh, as I said before, um, the women, uh, the, 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 the cash transfer system is an unconditional cash transfer system. So there were no conditions attached, and so there was none of that paperwork required. Um, but where women provided mutual support to each other was in going to the ATMs um, to withdraw money um, and help each other out. Next slide, please. So we're now talking about the second mechanism, the functionality of the program account. And what we found here was there was a mix of knowledge about whether the account could actually be used for other means. The accounts um, can be used for other means. Uh, and specifically, it is possible in both cases to leave money in the account and withdraw it later. Um, and there was a mix, depending on, on, on the individuals um, in each of the focus groups in each country, we found different levels of knowledge about whether you could leave money in the account or not, uh, including, and then when I did this presentation in, in New York, someone with, with field experience in the, in the Columbia um, situation noted that still in many um, areas of Columbia, uh, pro representatives of the um, Familia Sin Acción uh, program uh, were conveying the information that you should not leave money in your account. So, so um, even though you, you you actually could leave money in your account, um, but so there was some some mixed uh, messages and mixed understanding of of, of that functionality. Uh, furthermore, um, in Colombia, there was a mix of people who who some of, many many said they would not leave their money in the account and some who said they sometimes did. Um, in, next slide. In, in Pakistan, um, there was a general uh, feeling that it was very difficult to leave money in the account, uh, in part because they really needed the money. Um, but there was also fear that they might lose the money um, if the program ended um, or simply lose track of the, the money. Next slide, please. Um, I'm still on functionality of program account, Pakistan. Thank you. Um, and then what we saw in Colombia was, um, an, you know, this is this is a country where the system's been uh, in place for almost 10 years, um, and the we know that the women really like the the, the way the system works. Uh, they can get their money out easily. And what they do is, uh, from our focus group data, what they do is they simply withdraw all the money and then keep it at home. They're much more comfortable with having the money at home rather than leaving it in a bank account to be withdrawn later. Um, in Pakistan, there was little, infam little discussion of saving money at home at all. Um, and again, what seemed to be going on in Pakistan is people simply needed the money. Next slide, please. Um, and then uh, there was a little dialogue in the, one of the Pakistan focus groups about um, uh, people being better off buying a goat than leaving money in a bank account. Um, uh, and uh, we can discuss whether that's a good idea or not uh, in Q&A if people are interested. Next slide, please. Um, and then finally, the, one of the other mechanisms is the relationship with the financial service provider. Um, and in both Pakistan and Colombia, the sense was that there was no advantage to um, having a relationship with the financial service provider through the G2P payment system. Uh, that did not translate into uh, any sort of cross-selling by the bank with new and different products uh, for that uh, target population. Um, and I should note that in in previous work, one of the one of the things I learned um, about uh, the situation in Pakistan was that um, one of the banks involved in this in the GDP uh, program was basically using the GDP program to help uh, support it, the build out of its agent network, um, not because it wanted to serve low income people um, specifically, but because it wanted to serve 
people in a slightly higher income bracket who, who um, they felt were more profitable but needed an agent network to serve them. Um, so the economics on the side of the financial service providers um, may suggest that um, there's not a lot of value in cross-selling to this population. Next slide, please. Uh, the one place where there was some cross-selling was children's accounts in, in Colombia. Uh, these are no-fee accounts, and um, uh, the banks offer these to, to their clients. And so uh, that, that's one way in which um, there was some uh, connection between the G2P payment receipt and the, and the opening of the new account. Next slide, please. Uh, and then in, I should note in Colombia, it's not that uh, people were scared of banks or didn't like banks. They just didn't feel that banks were could provide the services that they needed um, at this time. Next slide, please. Uh, in Pakistan, uh, one of the things that came out of the um, focus group data that was also supported in the FINDEX analysis is that uh, there was a number of people in, in the focus groups who said that they were uh, better able to access store credit because they were recipients of the BISP, the Benny Zero Income Support Payments. Um, so essentially, shopkeepers are extending credit on the basis of the fact that people are going to get their payment and will be able to repay uh, the credit that uh, they've built up. Next slide, please. And then finally, looking at the mechanisms around uh, more longer-term impact of, of GDP programs. Um, in focus groups with women in Pakistan, education of kids came out as a real positive impact of the GDP program generally. Um, they felt like they, could, they had more money to educate their kids. And so the argument might be that um, extending um, um, it, it, enabling kids of low-income families to get educated will result in all sorts of benefits, including financial inclusion. And then, of course, in Colombia, the Familias en Acción program requires the, the low-income households send their kids to school. So there's um, going to be a long-term impact on the kids, uh, which will lead to Great, likely re lead to greater financial inclusion as well as all sorts of other positive benefits. Uh, next slide, please. And then um, once again, goats in Pakistan, um, the fact that people were getting a large sum of money, which was equivalent to what it roughly cost to buy a goat or got you a, a, way, a ways towards buying a goat, I should say, um, uh, was um, was one potential mechanism by which um, these uh, GDP payments could result in improved economic well-being. Next slide, please. So some concluding thoughts. Um, next slide, please. Uh, summary of findings. I'm actually um, not going to walk you through these. Hopefully, you were paying attention. Um, and if not, um, take a look at this slide uh, in your own time. Um, uh, uh, once we've done the Q&A. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. So one of the things that um, came out of my conversations with the folks at the Benazir Income Support Program and also the, um, the people in the World Bank in Pakistan was what to do about the fact that um, people were engaging in, in transactions that were, were not very secure and safe. They were handing over their cards and their PIN numbers, um, and they were also, uh, a lot of the time, these transactions would be conducted um, without the presence of the women beneficiaries. Um, and so one of the things that they're looking at in Pakistan is to do biometric verification, um, which would require the presence of the woman um, at the place of payment and also obviate the need for a card and PIN number. Uh, essentially, uh, you, you, you uh, provide your card and, and you, you put your, your thumb on a thumbprint reader and um, 
you can you can get your money as a result. Next slide, please. But the reason I bring this up is because it provides some really interesting perspective on the underlying gender dynamics in any of these systems in Pakistan um, and in other countries. About um, so, if you're going to build a GDP program that targets women um, or targets households and and you you and people within that household are women, you've got to take into account the gender dynamics on the ground. And when you move to um, a biometric system, you do actually need to um, think through what are the implications uh, of this for, uh, for gender dynamics um, and how this might play out on the ground in a place like Pakistan. Um, first of all, you, you want to have very clear um, um, ability to deliver money uh, on time, on schedule, um, and to communicate clearly about the timing and the schedule um, to um, beneficiaries. And this is especially important in a situation where you've got complex gender dynamics because, for example, if, if a woman if it's challenging for a woman to go and pick up money, she has to go with a, a male, male in a household, or she has to go with a group of women, or she risks um, violating cultural norms by traveling on her own. If she goes and picks up money, or goes to pick up money, and the money isn't there because there's been a miscommunication about it being there um, or not, and the, or the system is down, so the biometric readers don't work, and so she can't, her identity can't be verified. That means she has to make a second journey, which means that there are going to be negotiations and, and discussions within the household about her going a second time. It's also, um, if she's accompanied by a man, that's two bus trips to go to the agent, uh, and then two bus trips again to go a second time to pick up the money because the first time was a failure. So there's some interesting challenges that remain even with a biometric system, which speak to the larger issue of if you're going to be doing a GDP program and you're thinking about the ramifications of that for financial inclusion, you really need to look at the facts on the ground and how those are going to play out over time um, uh, to generate the results you want. Um, going again back to the example of Colombia, this is a well-worked system. People are happy with taking their money out. But the women in those households um, still prefer to take the money out and keep it at home and keep it in a bank account. Um, and that's something that may require additional information for the women, uh, more clear information to the women about the potential benefits of leaving the money in the, in the account um, and potential benefits of keeping it safe and also of keeping it out of temptation's way uh, so that they actually accumulate savings over time, which may mean some sorts of financial education. Next slide, please. Okay. So final concluding thoughts is get the payment systems right. That's incredibly important. Um, one of the ways in which to deal or to to address issues around uh, gender dynamics is to think about women's groups and women peer groups as a way to enable um, women to support each other. They also may be a platform for um, basic financial education initiatives uh, that can promote um, financial inclusion uh, activities by the recipients. And then finally, um, there's a long game here, which is Kids are being educated better these days. I think uh, my, my data would suggest that G2P programs are clearly keeping kids in school and helping to get kids in school. And so in the long run, there's going to be a positive benefit uh, to those kids. Uh, and one of those positive benefits is they're going to be better, ed better educated and, and enabled to uh, deal with the formal financial services. I think that's the last slide. Great. Thank you so much, Guy. And yeah. I
I'm just Sorry, putting up long. here. Oh, no worries. I mean, you're a professor, so I should have expected that. Um, I'm just putting <laughs> up here the link to the full report for all of you, and we'll have that up for the remainder of the hour. And I'd like to turn to question and answers um, at, at this point, and um, also comments, if anybody has a comment on those framing questions that I posed at the beginning about how G2P could be better tooled for the sake of financial inclusion um, and also um, for uh, better financial capability. So first I'd like to turn to Jeremy Gray from SendFreight. Jeremy, we're going to open up um, the line to you and unmute you here. Hang on one sec. All right, Jeremy, the floor is yours. Okay, great. Thanks, Sonia. Um, I think, yeah, thanks for a really interesting presentation. I think it's really interesting that many of the findings are, reflect quite closely to what we found in some of the countries, um, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa where we've done work. So um, I think we certainly found that G2P payments haven't necessarily driven financial inclusion. Um, I think in some cases we've even found that um, digitizing G2P payments is, has had the adverse effect um, where people have to travel long distances to, you know, receive welfare payments um, and even salaries when those have been digitized um, and has actually caused hardship in places like rural Mozambique. So there's obviously the access, which is a critical prerequisite, um, having the payments infrastructure in place, like you mentioned. And then, we, I mean, we've also looked at um, some of the grant recipients in South Africa, um, and we found really similar um, kind of findings in terms of why they indicated that they didn't use um, the bank accounts um, apart from just withdrawing their um, uh, welfare, welfare receipts fully in cash. Um, things like um, that... Uh, they the, the the accounts don't have the same necessary functionality. They aren't necessarily sure of the functionality that it has. Um, they want to keep um, some of the additional funds um, under the radar screen because they 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 don't want their their grants to be cut and those type of things. So it's really interesting that that, that that's reflected across um, a number of countries. I think my question is. Um, from from speaking to all these people across the different across Kalama and Pakistan, do you think that the, I mean I think it, it, it cuts across both, but are there issues around why people don't use those accounts in which they receive their, their grants? Is it more related to the ineffectiveness of those accounts to meet their underlying needs? So for example, um, a GOAT probably provides you a better savings mechanism than a savings account does, or is it, or is it as much, or even more, related to the kind of um, experience that people have and the kind of perception that people have of formal financial services, so that they are daunted to to walk into um, a bank branch, for example, or um, interact with a bank teller because they feel um, inferior, or they just have a negative perception, whereas when dealing with informal informal groups, they may get a lot of value from that social interaction with, for example, in women's savings groups. So I'm just interested, you know, do, do you think that the, the, that the issues are, are more related to kind of the, 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 the inability to meet the kind of core objectives that people are trying to achieve through their financial services, or is it more related to the kind of perception experience that people have um, in dealing with formal versus informal financial services? Yeah. I mean, I think there's a, there's a mix of both, but I was compelled by the Colombian women who all, you know, invariably wanted to keep the money at home and just have ready access to it. Um, I think with, with the Pakistanis, uh, the, 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 they were basically withdrawing all the money because they really needed it. And the, there was a clear sense in Pakistan that the, the needs were the economic needs were much greater there, and they were spending all that they were getting right away. Um, so, 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 and then, but there was also this issue of being concerned about leaving money in the account because, as you said, they may disqualify themselves for future funds. 
um, future transfers, uh, getting you know mixed messages from the program promoters saying you shouldn't leave money in the account. There are also these you know there's this issue you know in 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 total quality management research which says you know one negative comment by a client will travel you know will have ten times the effect of one positive comment. So if you hear from someone else that they had a bad experience with a bank account, um, that's going to count for a lot more than you know positive experiences that that are conveyed. So I think it's a mix of, of all, but I should I should know that I've done as, as I think people may know in the audience. Uh, Microfinance Opportunity has done um, a lot of financial diary studies. I, I just did a count. You've got um, 15 different financial diaries data sets, and what we see over and over again is people um, managing their money by keeping money at home and having that ready access to cash. And so, um, you know, creating mechanisms by which people um, can begin to work out how much money do I need to keep at home versus how much should I put away somewhere which is less accessible knowing it's less accessible, knowing that over the long term I'm going to accumulate savings. That sort of question, that decision point, um, needs to be looked at uh, more closely. Thank you. And now I'd like to turn to Loretta Michaels uh, to ask a question. And let me mention as well, we have a queue of a, a number of questions that have come in. Those questions that we are unable to get to, I will be sure to connect you directly with Guy so that you can have an email correspondence after this webinar. So do feel free to send them in even if we end up at the top of the hour. Loretta, let me turn to you now. All right, Loretta, you're all set to speak. Wonderful, thank you. Um, question on this ongoing issue about getting people to uh, accumulate savings. In your research, um, or and not just for this report, but in any other research, have you seen any kind of programs, incentive programs, that have, uh, that have successfully um, encouraged people or incented them to keep money in their accounts. I mean, this, this issue about concerns about uh, losing the money if they keep it in there too long or not taking it out all at once, it's, this is an ongoing problem uh, which has been observed in a number of these programs, but I'm wondering if you've actually seen proactive um, efforts on the part of banks or ministries, governments, to put incentive programs in place for keeping the, the funds in there, and if so, uh, ha what have been the results? Thanks. Right. Sure. Um, so Fundacion Capital has um, been doing a randomized control trial with its um, financial education intervention in Colombia. Um, I, the, the results are not official, and um, so uh, the, the people at Fundacion have sort of suggested that there have been some, some positive um, uh, impacts on uh, savings behavior. I'm not sure what they are, but um, keep an eye out for that. That's an, an IPA-funded uh, um, uh, research protocol um, in Colombia. Uh, so you should get some, some results out of that. And then, as I mentioned earlier, there was this study in Fiji that showed people um, keeping money in the accounts. Well, one of the things that I, I'll make a plug, um, a lot of you, may, again, may know I'm, I'm big into using data for, for promoting good causes and including financial inclusion. You know, there are governments and ministries all over the world who are doing these programs who should be able to put their hands on uh, data about whether money's been left in the account. And it would seem that a, a very obvious next step uh, following up on this research and the research that Senfree is doing and everything else is to get those data into our hands and so we can begin to understand when people do leave, leave their money, we can follow up with those people and find out you know, what, are, what, what are the reasons why they were able to leave leave their money and then develop 
profiles about them and stories about them and um, and provide some you know tips to to other people about them. So there's a lot of opportunity here to to go to an evidence-based initiative to uh, promote um, people uh, leaving their money in their account um, if it's appropriate for them, and we can find out whether it's appropriate for them. So. So that's that's one answer to your question. The other answer to your question, just on a on a side note, this is not to do with GDP, but the most successful way that I've ever seen of getting people to sort of accumulate money over time is um, savings groups. I, we just finished um, a diaries in El Salvador, Guatemala, and Zambia. Uh, in Zambia, it was with Catholic Relief Services, and and all across the board was seen. Um, accumulations of large amounts of money. In fact, the amounts of money in some ways were too large for them to actually know what to do with once share out came. But uh, savings groups are clearly a very powerful mechanism for accumulating long-term savings. Wonderful. And I think we have time for one last question. Let me turn to Monique Cohen. Hey, Monique. Uh, Monique, you're, you're unmuted and go ahead and speak. Can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you just fine. Yeah. Okay, so I thought it was very interesting, and I really congratulate you on your work. But I kind of have a question. There's no time variable here, and the question I think from the work that Fundación Capital has been doing, and from work in Bangladesh, that it takes about six months for people to be comfortable with using digital financial services. So I wondered, did you differentiate people by um, who had accounts with, say, six months or longer, or who we might describe as positive deviants, or people who had received training in financial capability, and whether the data would suggest that they have higher rates of usage, and um, does what are the implications of this for um, our need to invest in customers and help them to accelerate the process of using the um, uh, data. Now, I had another quick question, but we'll leave it at that. Sure. And, uh, let me just Thanks. add one thing. The one question I have is when we think about the value of these accounts, what is the relationship between the income support amount and the regular household income? because the smaller the ratio, I would think the less likely people are to use the bank account. Yeah, yeah. So um, those are great questions. Um, in the, the sense we, I'm, I'm, I'm very confident in Colombia we had a lot of um, experienced users um, longer than six months. The program in both countries has been going for uh, almost 10 years. Uh, both were started around the mid-2000s, 2007 or odd. So um, these are well-established programs, and the people within these programs, um, have, have, some of them have been in them for a long time. Um, and in Colombia, they've been in them a fair amount of time with a good existing system in place. In Pakistan, um, the experience, especially the move to digital, has been really choppy. And um, the work that I did in Pakistan built upon work uh, done by um, some uh, consultants for, who worked with CGAP on a um, human-centered design project. Uh, and the goal of that project was to design new products and services for people in the Benazir Income Support Program. Well, when they went into the country and looked at what was going on, they were they their basic point was, well, we can't design new products and services because the current service isn't working properly, and that was back in 2013. And what we've seen over the last three years is a sort of um, a stabilization of that that program in Pakistan. So in Pakistan, I think you've got a situation where people are still, um, you know, I think. Uh, people have had experience with the program, but the program has not been functioning as, as well as it has been in Colombia. So I think that we were, but the people we were generally talking to were people who had been in the program uh, for a while. Um, so, and then in terms of the, the ratios, um, 
Uh, I'd have to look at that question, um, but uh, um, I think the ratio, the the, the um, yeah, I'd have to look at the the ratios on that. I don't have the answer to that question. Thanks so much, Guy, and thank all of you for joining us. I know that your time is precious. I wish we could have scheduled this for two hours, but <laughs> wanted to recognize, um, you know, your your schedules, uh, and especially looking at the list of names of people who joined us today. We had policymakers and regulators. We had people from multilateral organizations. Um, we had research institutions, and um, and I hope that you know as you pursue this question in your own work or adjacent questions that, that Guy's research is able to, um, to inform what you're doing a bit. So um, if you'd like to be connected with Guy, uh, feel free to email me directly at skelly at axion.org and I would be happy to put you in touch. For those of you who submitted questions, I'll put you in touch directly um, given that we weren't able to get to all of the questions that were were asked today, some of them very, very thoughtful. Um, for more information, feel free to visit our website where you can download the paper, read a short summary, or share the research. Um, and the link to the full report is there on the screen on the last, um, the last page of the webinar. So feel free to take a screenshot. <laughs> and we hope we, you have a very good rest of your week. And we look forward to you joining us for our next webinar. Thank you.